he's not going to heaven. I know for sure that this man is not going to heaven. We either had a mass suicide or a mass murder. I went into a different room, especially when I went to the cellar. I didn't know what I was going to find. Methodically kill your mother, your wife, and your three kids is beyond comprehension. The oldest we've ever pursued on America's Most Wanted. The suspect is accused of murdering his family 17 years ago. Nobody had a clue where he disappeared to or even remotely what he looked like. It is a sad truth that most murders in America occur within families. They are usually crimes of passion, often preceded by a long history of violence in the home. But John List was different. When he murdered all five members of his immediate family in 1971, there had been few of the typical warning signs, and the cold-hearted calculation of his plan sent shockwaves across the country. John List has seldom spoken publicly about the crime. On this program, in a rare interview, he gives American justice the full story. As we search for some insight into this enigmatic mass murderer and discover how law enforcement had to devise new methods to catch him. Westfield, New Jersey, 15 miles outside of New York City. In the early morning of August 30th, 1972, Officer Charles Haller responds to reports of a fire at 431 Hillside Avenue. We got almost to the top of the hill and you could see these flames in the sky in it. So we went toward the direction of the flames and it was the house. The house, as everyone in Westfield knew, had been the scene of a grisly multiple murder the previous year, and residents were still reeling. We were shocked and devastated. We didn't think uh, anything happened in Westfield, especially a crime like that. By sunrise, the fire had nearly consumed the stately home, and with it, the last physical reminder of a small town's most infamous crime. Just 10 months earlier, in the fall of 1971, the 19-room Victorian mansion had been the dream home of the List family. John List, an unassuming 46-year-old accountant, lived there with his wife, Helen, the couple's three teenage children and John's 85-year-old mother, Alma. A strict Lutheran and an active member of the church, List was viewed in the community as the quiet patriarch of a devout family. Author Timothy Benford has interviewed nearly everyone involved in the List case. He was a deeply religious man, uh, introverted, soft-spoken, a gentleman, uh, the kind of person you would not mind having as a next-door neighbor. And this, the whole family was like that. In the six years the family had lived in Westfield, there had been no indication of trouble. But that was about to change. The week of November 9, 1971, letters arrived at the schools of the List children, 16-year-old Patty, 15-year-old John, and 13-year-old Frederick. Their father had written that the family would be going out of town for a few weeks to help care for an ailing relative. For those next few weeks, the imposing List mansion sat quietly, lit up by the interior house lights. And this stayed on, it stayed on for days, days passed, weeks passed. Slowly, finally, eventually the lights start going out one by one. This aroused the suspicions of neighbors who called Westfield police. On December 7th, officers Charles Heller and George Zelznick were dispatched to the List House. By this time, the family hadn't been seen for nearly a month. My partner and I parked out on the street, walked up, Went around, checked the house, everything appeared to be in order. Neighbors informed the officers that the family was on a trip. They didn't know whether List's elderly mother had gone with them. 
Concerned for her well-being, the two policemen decided to enter through an unlocked window. We started looking around the house, and there was a light coming from the second floor, which sort of lit very eerily the first floor. Um, just enough light that you could get around, but not with very good vision. They passed through the butler's pantry into the kitchen. There, they noticed what appeared to be bloodstains on the floor. And the unnerving part of the whole situation was that there was music playing in the house, and it was a very uh, classical, serene, almost like you would hear if you went to a funeral parlor. The officers then made their way towards the ballroom on the opposite side of the house. There were great big drapes over this archway, and of course when we opened the drapes and put our flashlights in the room where there was no light, we discovered a rather grisly sight. We could see there were several bodies in sleeping bags with their faces covered. I called out several times that this was the Westfield police. Would you mind getting up in that? Nobody responded. Laid out in a neat row were the bodies of Helen List and her three children. Patricia, Frederick, and John. All had been shot in the head. The middle child, John, showed evidence of multiple bullet wounds. Officer Zelznik immediately went to call for backup. I don't remember exactly, but I, I think I re said something to the fact we either had a mass suicide or a mass murder. Still unaccounted for were John List and his mother. The officers split up to search for them as they waited for backup to arrive. This is a big house, three floors. Every time I, I went into a different room, especially when I went in the cellar, I didn't know what I was going to find. I did have definitely a sense of that perpetrator of this crime might still be in the house. Of course, this was not too long after the movie Psycho was around, and it was still vivid in my mind. And as I opened each closed door, I had the sense that somebody was going to jump out at me. Backup soon arrived, and after nearly 45 minutes of searching, the officers made it to a third-floor apartment. There, in a back room, they found the body of John List's 85-year-old mother, Alma. She, too, had a gunshot wound to the head. The position that she was on the floor, the way she had fell to her knees and then fell over backwards, it was like she was trying to get away from somebody. The only member of the household now unaccounted for was John List. But police didn't have to wonder why for long. In his first floor office, they found a five-page letter written by List and addressed to his pastor. It was dated November 9, 1971, four weeks earlier. In it, in a detached, meticulous tone, List took full responsibility for the murder of his family. He wrote that he was facing bankruptcy and that he had killed his family to spare them from what he believed were the sinful effects of a life of poverty. He wrote, quote, at least I'm certain that all have gone to heaven now. He ended the letter with a chilling detail, writing, P.S. Mother is in the hallway in the attic, third floor. She was too heavy to move. With a mass murderer on the loose, authorities launched a nationwide manhunt. Two days after finding the bodies, police located List's Chevy Impala at Kennedy International Airport. But the fugitive list had nearly a month head start. For two more decades, the letter he left at the crime scene would be the last that was heard from him. In December 1971, five members of the List family were discovered murdered in their Westfield, New Jersey home. The culprit, the family patriarch, 46-year-old John List. He had left a letter at the scene admitting to the killings and then disappeared without a trace. The crime and the killer had shocked the small town. To methodically kill your mother, your wife, and your three kids is beyond comprehension. Anyone who knew John List all reacted the same way, that how could he have done this? Why did he do it? Now incarcerated in a New Jersey prison, the 77-year-old List sat down with American Justice to try to answer those questions. 
In a candid interview, List described a background that held no apparent motivation for his crime. Instead, it seemed his life was marked by a series of minor disappointments that eventually became too much for him to bear. John Emil List was born in Bay City, Michigan in 1925, the son of strict German-American parents. It was a quiet uh, childhood. I was an only child, so uh, there were no brothers or sisters to either play with or fight with. His father, Frederick, was a stern, hardworking man who valued self-sufficiency. His mother, Alma, obsessively doted on her son. Both parents were devout Lutherans, and from an early age, List was taught to be a good Christian. Believing in God and loving him, and also being kind to fellow people, and it became you know, a very important part of my life. After graduating high school, List served in World War II, where he saw heavy combat in Germany during the final weeks of the war. When he returned home in 1946, List went to college, earned a degree in business administration, and moved to Virginia. It was there in September 1951 that he met a 25-year-old widow named Helen Taylor. The two began dating, and after only three months, Helen and John were married in a Lutheran church in Baltimore, Maryland. Let me introduce myself. Psychiatrist Stephen Simring evaluated John List following his arrest. He believes the marriage to Helen was the first of several disappointments for List. He was forced to marry her because she said she was pregnant. It turned out that she was not pregnant. And then years later, he was resentful about his impression that she perhaps had misled him uh, as a way of getting him to marry her. List, though, says he shunned confrontation and tried to make the best of his marriage. The couple soon started a family. The children, Patricia, John, and Frederick, were born within four years of each other. List was, by most accounts, an attentive parent. He was maybe not the gregarious father who ran around and ran his fingers through his kids' hair and played ball with them on the front lawn, but he was, in his own way, he was a good father. From what others told me, I did a fairly good job. I certainly loved them all. But beneath this seemingly pleasant exterior lurked an individual completely unable to express his feelings. This was a man who was deeply repressed, a guy who had always kept his emotions to himself. From the time he was a small boy, he kind of sucked it up and buried it. In 1958, with three children and a wife to support, List began a series of accounting jobs that brought him little success. Over the next seven years, as List struggled to advance his career, the family often moved to accommodate his frequent job changes. He was let go each time, not because of work performance, but because there was something about his personality. In 1965, List was hired by the First National Bank of New Jersey as a vice president. His career, it seemed, was finally on track. The Lists immediately bought one of the grandest old homes in the affluent town of Westfield, New Jersey. He did not want the big house. He felt that he was being pushed to do this by his wife and by the demands of a growing family. He made the decision to borrow money from his mother and then invite his mother to live with him. The pictures from the time seem idyllic, but pressures were building. List and his wife, who tried to access were often at odds, and their marital problems only increased with the presence of List's overbearing mother. Then in 1966, having failed to fit in at his job once again, John List was fired from the bank after only one year. From that point on, I think it's when the, the downfall really began. That's, that's when he started realizing he was not a success, he was failing to provide for his family, and. Uh, the problems kept mounting. His pride, List says, compelled him to hide this from his family. I guess I was sort of beaten down uh, you know, from the failures that I had had. And I was ashamed to let anybody know. He would get dressed up in a suit and drive his car to the train station and take the train a few stops so people 
thought John List was still viably employed and he was doing well. Overwhelmed by his problems, List came to view his family as a burden. Mr. List was not aware of the degree of his anger and his resentment. He was resentful of his mother for years and years. He was resentful of his wife from the time she had tricked him into marrying him, he believed. And he was resentful of his children for all kinds of reasons that many of us resent teenagers who can be a pain in the, uh, in the, in the rear end. That resentment built over the next five years as List moved through a string of unsuccessful jobs. By November 1971, he was facing bankruptcy. The proud, deeply religious List now began contemplating his options. First was the idea of suicide, which he considered mortal sin. I felt that if you committed suicide, you would automatically go to hell. There was the possibility of simply fleeing the scene and leaving the family to the mercy of the welfare state. His pride uh, simply ruled this out as well. He reached a point where he felt that family was going to have to go on welfare, they were going to be destitute. And in List's understanding of religion, poverty was a sin. He felt that they would lose their eternal soul and be damned. List, seeing no other choice, finally made a decision, one he later explained in his shocking five-page letter to his pastor. I kept thinking about it for several weeks, I'm sure, maybe even a month, and uh, my final solution was that if I would kill them, that would save them from any uh, problems. He killed his family, according to him, for the purpose of sending them to heaven. I felt that even though I killed the family, I could still get forgiveness eventually from God. Though List would later admit his solution was horrific, he attributed it to what psychiatrists termed an obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. This simply means that he's the kind of individual who doesn't feel problems, but rather represses problems and tends to deal with things in an emotionless, rather cold, clinical way. Yeah, I've been analyzed by the psychiatrist as being the type of person that I get into a rut of rethinking the problem and never coming up with any new ideas or just coming back to the same solution that uh, I came up with the first time. With the same chilling detachment John List used to devise his plan of murder, he would now go on to carry it out. On November 9, 1971, in Westfield, New Jersey, John List was preparing to carry out an unthinkable crime, the murder of his entire family. I had just gotten myself so convinced that this was what I had to do that I was going to go through with the whole program. That morning, after getting dressed, List walked down to the kitchen to have breakfast with his three children, Patricia, John, and Frederick. I tried not to act any different than I ordinarily would, you know, so they wouldn't be suspicious. Like he did on every other school day, List watched them eat their meals, then rush out the door for school. After they were gone, I went out to the garage and got the guns ready. The weapons were this 9mm handgun, which had belonged to his father, and this antique 22 caliber pistol he kept as a souvenir from his war days. List's wife, Helen, meanwhile, had come down to the kitchen for her morning coffee. I came back in, said a few words to Helen, and went into the front room. Then I came around back and uh, shot her in the head. List then went to his mother's third floor apartment, where she was just beginning to eat breakfast. She got over and you know, greeted me and gave me a kiss. And, I, and she said, what was that noise? And at that point, I felt like a Judas having you know, kissed her too. And I said, oh, it must have been some noise out in the back. That's why I came up to see her. 
going into the attic area, and as she got to the doorway, I killed her. List then headed downstairs to clean up the evidence of his wife's murder before the children returned home. I was very surprised at the amount of blood that you know, drained out. And I think there was some shell, shell casing you know, and some of her um, false teeth had gotten um, broken and were out on the, both the table and on the floor. I cleaned all that up. He then dragged Helen's lifeless body into the seldom used ballroom. Afterwards, List wrote letters to his children's schools explaining that the family would be going away on a trip. He then drove to the bank, where he withdrew more than $2,000 from the account he shared with his mother. He also went to the post office to send the letters and stop the mail. After coming home, List made himself a sandwich and waited for his children to return from school. Even with his wife and mother dead in the house, List says he had no second thoughts. I don't believe that while I was eating, uh, especially at lunchtime, that I uh, had any feelings of, you know, I should stop and not go any farther with this. I just felt that once I had started, it was incumbent upon me to kill all of the children so that not even one of them would remain and suffer the trauma that they would go through having, knowing that the rest of the family had been killed. List's 16-year-old daughter, Patty, was the first to arrive home. As she walked into the kitchen, List snuck up behind her and shot her in the head. He moved her corpse into the ballroom and placed her on a sleeping bag near her mother. I just saw it was better than just laying them on the blank floor. There was no carpet in most of the house. When his youngest son, 13-year-old Frederick, entered the house, List shot him in the back of the head and placed him on a sleeping bag next to his sister. Then, instead of waiting for his last child, John, to come home, List decided to pick him up at school. He had a soccer game. So I went over and watched the soccer game. He seemed to be playing a good game and enjoying himself. And then we came home together in the car. Father and son walked in through the kitchen door and the 15-year-old placed his gym bag on the counter. His father then came up behind him and shot him in the head. But this final murder would not be as quick as the others. All the others, they just, you know, dropped. So I knew they were dead. With John, I don't know whether it was a, a muscle reaction that caused him to jerk around a little bit, but then I shot several more times. It was later determined that List shot his son 10 times. He claims, though, that John, like the rest, did not suffer. That was the one thing I was trying to prevent, was there feeling any wounds or suffering, you know, at the last moment. How compassionate, huh? <laughs> After moving John's body into the ballroom with the rest of the family, List's mission was at last complete. I think after I had shot John and cleaned up, I felt such a measure of relief that this plot that I had was carried out without being interrupted. I'm more or less relaxed after that. One of the first things he did was sit down in the kitchen for another meal. Having been in combat, you know, we were out killing and fighting, and then we'd come in and have something to eat. I think that's what allowed me to you know, eat peacefully in the room that I had killed my family. After dinner, he straightened up the kitchen, then went upstairs to bed. That night, I may not have slept 100% soundly, but I think I got probably a better night's rest than I had the night before all this happened. The next morning, List prepared his getaway. 
First, he turned the thermostat down to 50 degrees, hoping to keep the bodies from decomposing. He then turned on all the lights in the house and tuned the radio to his favorite classical music station. I felt that if some intruder wanted to get into the house, that they might back off if they've heard music and thought that people were in the house. That was another reason I left all the lights on, I believe, to make it look like there were people there. One of Liszt's final acts was to write a letter to his pastor, explaining his reasons for murdering his family. I guess I just felt closest to him and felt that since I was a member of his congregation, that uh, he deserved a more complete explanation. It would be nearly a month before police discovered the letter and the bodies of his family. By that time, List was 2,000 miles away. He had boarded a train bound for the western United States. I just thought I would like to see the mountains and, and relax a little bit because I had been under a lot of strain. List went to Denver, moved into a motel room, and changed his name to Robert P. Clark. He went to work as a cook in a hotel restaurant on the outskirts of town and gradually established a new identity. He enjoyed his life in Denver. It was a fresh start for him in every sense of the word. Remember, his problem was that he was overburdened. He had been a failure in every way. He saw his family as a burden, not a source of support. They were all gone, poof, and he was free. List says he was rarely haunted by guilt or remorse. Slowly but surely, his past life became a faded memory. I guess as time went on, I thought less and less of family. I suppose I was just thankful to be living a free life and you know, didn't want to be uh, incarcerated if it wasn't necessary. By 1985, nearly 15 years had passed since John List murdered his family and became a fugitive. His life had long since returned to normal. He went back to his old career as an accountant and even met a woman at a church function whom he went on to marry. Police, though, were no closer to finding him than they had been in 1971. Still, many officers remain committed, some even say obsessed, with finding John List and bringing him to justice. The result, a remarkable alliance between law enforcement and the media that would finally crack the case. Girl never came home. We didn't have a crime. We didn't have a victim. But one person knows exactly what happened to her. She said to me, I'm going to tell you something that I didn't tell the family. She's dead. I know he's the killer. How did she know that? Psychic Investigators, Sunday at 9, only on Bio. In 1986, outside Denver, Colorado, 61-year-old fugitive John List had recently remarried and was living a quiet life as an accountant named Robert Clark. Neither his wife nor his friends had any idea that nearly 15 years earlier, List had murdered all five members of his immediate family. I just more or less existed and uh, just go along and do what has to be done, I guess, to just survive. Back in Westfield, New Jersey, residents were well aware that the perpetrator of one of the most notorious crimes in state history was still at large. The people in Westfield uh, thought about him every year on the anniversary. Every paper in the state of New Jersey covered the story. Uh, it was two years, it was five years, it was ten years since the list murders. Where is he now? The FBI had long since joined the search for John List, and he became one of their most wanted fugitives. As for the local police in Westfield, even 15 years after the crime, capturing List remained a high priority. For him to be gone for that many years and not be brought to justice was like a personal affront to the office and to the Westfield Police Department. Over the years, they received mailbags full of tips, all to no avail. We really never had a lead that was really even close. And yet we followed them all to, you know, their limit, and uh, it, it became very frustrating. No matter how cold the case became, the officers did not forget it. 
we would go on vacation and periodically we would send a postcard back to the homicide squad uh, while on vacation saying, having a wonderful time, wish you were here, and sign it, John List. So it was kind of a joke in the office at all times, you know, as to where the heck did this guy go? Police working on the List case had collaborated with local media on several occasions in the past with no success. Good evening from Washington, D.C. It's Sunday, June 4th, and I'm John Walsh. But by 1988, a new national television show was beginning to capture the public's attention. The program was America's Most Wanted, and authorities believed it might be their best opportunity to finally find John List. He had already been a fugitive for 17 years, so he was either out there not getting in trouble, or maybe he was dead. So whichever way it worked, we just wanted to clear this case. When police and the FBI first approached America's Most Wanted, they were turned down. I mean, that was a real stretch to think about doing a guy that nobody had a clue where he disappeared to or even remotely what he looked like. Still, authorities did not give up and even shared gruesome details of the crime. After nine months of repeated requests, in April 1989, producers at last consented. The more I got involved in the case, I said to myself, wouldn't it be something if we caught this guy? You have to be such a despicable monster. That son of a bitch, John List, killed his own children. By this time, John List had moved from Denver to Richmond, Virginia, with his second wife, Dolores Miller. There, List had found a job with an accounting firm. It was a quiet life. On most weekends, List gardened and watched TV. Among his favorite programs was America's Most Wanted. List was such a fan of the show that he regularly urged his friends and neighbors to watch. And it was strange, but I thought, I wonder if they're ever going to show my situation and uh, do a program on me. And I think it was within a month or two after that, they, they did have the show on. Now tonight's first case, the oldest we've ever pursued on America's Most Wanted. The suspect, John List, is accused of murdering his family 17 years ago. Because the crime was so old, producers had taken the unusual step of hiring an artist to sculpt a plaster bust of List, which depicted how he might look nearly two decades after the crime. List is described as a quiet, soft-spoken man, the kind who wears a shirt and tie to mow the lawn. John List remembers watching the program from his home in Richmond. I saw the tail end of it. I saw that it was about me and I saw the bus that they had. I was surprised at how accurate it was. I didn't realize that they had that technology. After the show aired, more than 200 tips were phoned in, claiming knowledge of John List's whereabouts. One call stood out. It was from Denver, Colorado. It was a next-door neighbor, and when they did the report on the List murders, she was convinced that that was uh, Bob Clark, the neighbor who lived next door, who had just moved with his wife to uh, Virginia. The FBI was immediately contacted regarding the tip. Eleven days later, on June 1st, 1989, Federal agents arrived at the Richmond home of Bob Clark while he was at work. When the FBI went to the house, uh, his wife, Dolores, his new wife, uh, didn't believe that it really was John List. Like most people would be, you'd be totally shocked. This comes out of a clear blue sky. She apparently had no suspicions or inclinations whatsoever that this could even be possible. Hoping to prove the agents wrong, Dolores told them they could find her husband, Bob Clark, at his accounting office. Two agents went to where he was working. When they talked to him, he, of course, denied being John List. Then they brought him back to uh, headquarters where they fingerprinted him, and they compared his fingerprints to that of John List, and it came back as a match. No questions asked. It was John List. That same day, John List was placed under arrest. After nearly 18 years, Police had at last caught their man. But the person calling himself Robert Clark 
still refused to admit he was John List. He just absolutely denied it. It's not me. I don't know what you're talking about. Even after he was confronted with the fact that his fingerprints were a match, he still was like, it's not me. My name is Robert P. Clark. I says to him, you know, John, we know it's you. But he just smiled and didn't say anything. When I got the word that he was caught, I did cartwheels. There's some great satisfaction in this because this coward, this son of a, is a child killer. And you know what? We caught him. After so many years on the run, John List was finally going to court. It was only here that he would drop the alias of Robert Clark and admit he was, in fact, the missing John List. Meanwhile, police back in Westfield, New Jersey, had preserved nearly every piece of evidence from the 17-year-old crime, making the prosecution's job at trial that much easier. As for John List's defense, everyone was eager to hear exactly what it would be. On June 29, 1989, 63-year-old John List was extradited from Virginia to New Jersey to face first-degree murder charges for the 1971 killing of his entire family. There was an extremely high-profile arrest and transportation. Coming off the plane was a little scary, because every news media in the world must have been at Newark Airport. In Westfield, where the murders had taken place, police chief Bernard Tracy had been working the case for more than 11 years. He remembers his reaction to the news that List had finally been caught. I was shocked. I mean, I was very happy, of course, but shocked. My first thought was, you know, I can't believe they got him, and I can't believe he's alive, and wow, would I like to talk to this guy and find out what he was thinking. One of the people who did get to speak with List was Stephen Simring, a criminal psychiatrist. He was hired by the state to assess his mental condition. The four-hour interview was recorded on video. He was mild-mannered, courteous, soft-spoken, um, very precise and very exact. He also expressed no remorse and only superficial regret. He said essentially, Something that had to happen, it was unfortunate. I felt that all the family would be able to go to heaven and that I that maybe I had a chance to go to heaven with that. Following the interview, Simring gave his opinion. John List, he said, suffered from an obsessive, compulsive personality disorder. But nothing more serious than that. He did not have a major mental illness. There was no psychiatric legal excuse either to excuse or to mitigate. As the state prepared to make its case, lawyers for John List scrambled to make theirs. The strategy was simple. List would admit to the murders but blame the crime on his personality disorder. The trial began on April 2nd, 1990, in New Jersey Superior Court. With neither side denying that List had committed the murders, the lone issue was whether he was able to willfully deliberate his actions. Prosecutor Eleanor Clark argued that he was and should therefore be found guilty of first-degree murder. The burden on the state was to say um, he may be obsessive compulsive, but he was able to deliberate and consequently he should not be absolved. The defense countered that List had only committed the murders because of a quote, diminished mental capacity brought on by his obsessive compulsive personality disorder. His lawyer, Elijah Miller, argued that he should be found guilty of the less serious charge of second degree murder. He was not a capable person. He was fragmented. He could not deviate from his course of action, and these acts occurred. Once I could start on a way to go, uh, I keep chugging along that way even though might sometimes be better to stop and take another look at the situation. Psychiatrist Stephen Simring took the stand for the prosecution. I don't accept his explanation that he was on some kind of autopilot. I believe he always had a choice and was mentally capable of executing that choice. I mean, the man definitely has a personality disorder. 
hands down, I have no problem. Do you want any? I mean, it's like how a trial attorney say, hey, it may be crazy, but it ain't insane. The most damning evidence the prosecution had was the letter John List himself had written to his pastor following the murders, in which he took full responsibility for the crime. Though the letter was in essence a confession, the prosecution went one step further, vigorously attacking what they saw as the hypocrisy of List's beliefs. State's attorneys pointed out that while List believed killing his family was a forgivable sin, he reasoned that his own suicide would not have been. Well, I think no matter how religious you are, you realize that there's a little problem with this. I found this uh, horrific, and through my tone of voice and the nature of my questions, I try to communicate this to the jurors. He riddles them with bullets. Do you need any more to demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant acted intentionally? On April 11th, the nearly two-week trial of John List concluded. The next day, after nine hours of deliberation, the jury delivered a verdict that surprised no one. Guilty on all five counts of murder in the first degree. Three weeks later, on May 1st, a sentencing hearing was held for List, during which he made his first public statement regarding his crime. I remain truly <coughs> sorry for the tragedy that happened in 1971. I feel that due to my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. Because the murders were committed in 1971, before New Jersey had reinstated the death penalty, the maximum allowable sentence was five consecutive life terms. This was the sentence Judge William Wertheimer handed down. I've sat in so many courtrooms, I never heard a courtroom break out in applause. Court adjourned. That old deserved everything he got. He should have gotten the death penalty. He should have fried him. John List entered prison in May 1990. Though the aging inmate will serve the rest of his life behind bars, he takes some solace in the 17 years he spent on the run. I feel that I got my parole time in before I went to prison rather than after. As for his life in prison, List says he has made the best of it. I have a job that uh, I enjoy doing and I feel I'm contributing at least something here. I feel it's safer in here than being out in the, uh, in the public, the way some people drive uh, with road anger and these people that just kill people at random. They're much safer here. Now in a case forever associated with one man's twisted beliefs, for some, a lingering question remains. It's a terrible thing that John Lewis did, but can we be forgiven for even those sins? I hope so. And John Lewis can go to heaven, and well, I hope he does. Oh, he's not going to heaven. I know, well, I know for sure that this man is not going to heaven. He's going straight to hell, right where his ass belongs. I think uh, I will go to heaven. I don't know what si the situation will be in heaven, will there? They will remember what I did to them. Certainly, if we're all in heaven, I'm sure we would forgive each other for whatever harm we had done to each other here. Since his conviction, John List has twice appealed his case. On the second go-round, his attorneys presented psychiatric evidence, suggesting their client suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of his World War II military service. They argued that this might account for the grisly murders and that List should be granted a new trial. The judge angrily rejected List's petition. In an ironic end note, after the List home burned down in 1972, it was discovered that the stained glass ceiling in the ballroom was made by the renowned Louis Comfort Tiffany and worth an estimated $100,000. If List had realized this at the time, he might have used that money to solve his family's troubles without resorting to murder.
They hitchhiked to save money. He knew that it would be some time before anybody realized they were missing. But they ended up paying dearly. These girls had been savagely murdered, and it was a very grisly business. Crime Stories, tonight at 10.